This old army depot is an eerie place. Built in World War II, it once held high explosive munitions and later chemical weapons in the Cold War. But now it's decommissioned and for the most part empty. About the only thing you see in all of this open space is David Johnson in his white van. Oh, those are all right there. David has come here on behalf of one of the last residents of the Umatilla Chemical Depot, the burrowing owls. When we first came to the depot to work on the burrowing owl project, there were three or four pairs, and we knew that this was the last of them. If we lose them here, then we're gonna lose them all together, and it's really hard to recover from zero. And so then the question is, what do you do? Burrowing owls weren't just disappearing from the depot. Their numbers are dropping across North America. They're endangered in Canada. They're threatened in Mexico. Colorado just uplisted them to threatened at the state level. The population is declining about two or three percent per year. David discovered that the problem was a lack of burrows. In nature, animals like badgers, gophers, and prairie dogs dig burrows. Owls find them and claim them. But more and more native prairie land has been developed for human use. Badgers are often trapped and prairie dogs poisoned. And without these animals to dig new burrows, the owls have fewer natural places to call home. Not enough nest holes, there's no reproduction. Boom, they decline. So we put in artificial burrows to try to rescue that. There are 999 bunkers on the depot. They were designed to hold military explosives, built of concrete, heaped with dirt. They're spaced out so that if one were to explode, the next one wouldn't blow up and set off a chain reaction. Not that long ago, they stored 12% of America's deadliest chemical weapons, like sarin and mustard gas. And now, they're all empty, except one. David uses it as his workshop. This is our design for an artificial burrow system. It's made of six inch. Through trial and error and good old fashioned DIY ingenuity, David's developed a homemade burrow from plastic barrels, buckets, and irrigation tubes. Right now there's about 182 of these on the depot at 90 sites. One of the folks helping David is Jeff Mock of the Oregon National Guard. I'm out here because the National Guard has acquired the use of about 7,500 acres here on the former Umatilla Depot. As a military agency, we have a mandate to manage the natural resources that occur here. And so being able to accommodate research is a good way to help fulfill that mandate that we've gotten from Congress. David and Jeff load up their newly built burrow and take it out to install. You know, for many of these places, if it wasn't for artificial burrows, there wouldn't be any burrowing owls. Uh, this is a last ditch effort to save them. So our nest chamber is finished. We've got it backfilled, our tunnel is good. We've lined the tunnel with sand. We've armored the front entrance. We're done with the site, and now we'll let the owls find it. Our experience has been is that it may well be by this time tomorrow there's tracks. They find it overnight. You know, their whole life depends on burrows and they know how to find them. So we're good here. We put in the first burrows here as a rescue mission to save the population. And it quickly turned into an opportunity. Not only are we saving them, we have a unique opportunity to really learn. In order to study the owls, David needed to figure out how to catch them. We have a speaker in an MP3 player. And you hear the cuckoo call. That's the main territorial call of the male, okay? Now we're gonna put this trap on the front. We want him to think that somebody else has just invaded his burrow. When I realized how much investment those males were making in that burrow is when I realized you can put a speaker in there and play a, a pesky intruder. I don't want to be a dominant competitor. I just want to be a pesky intruder. And they're not having it. So they come out, they strut back and forth. They cuckoo, cuckoo, come out, come out, come out. Don't make me come in there. 
all of a sudden it doesn't come out you go in I catch them all okay when you start thinking like an owl they're yours he pulls the owl to identify its age he looks at the feathers we're going to take some photographs of his wings that'll help with our understanding about molt and being able to age birds by their molt. This is a really strong barring pattern. It goes all the way across. So I'm, I'm thinking this guy is a two-year-old. He is small and underweight. He's not a very dominant male. And so the six-year-olds, five-year-olds, eight-year-olds that we have on the depot are going to take this guy and just pound him. It's like, um, you know, you're not getting my territory. After David has caught and recorded all the males, he waits a few weeks. By early May, the owls have paired up. Now it's time to check on the nests. David heads out with his intern, Julia. So let's plunge this one first and then we'll move the, move the kids over. David's design allows him access to peek into the burrows. The babies make a sound similar to a rattlesnake hiss as a defense mechanism. You'll hear it when you open up a burrow from the top. Um, it's a way to ward off predators. Even after opening hundreds of burrows, you still get a little bit spooked from it. So we banned them when they're 20 days old. They're individually numbered so that we can know how long they live, where they go, who they mate with. Uh, where on the depot do they nest? So it allows us to, to track individuals through time. And uh, I've banded probably a little over 6,000 burrowing owls now in the last 11 years. David's studies have revealed some unexpected results. We knew that they were migratory, didn't have any idea where they went. When we put geolocators on to try to identify their migrations, we thought they all went south. You would think that. The females all went south for the winter. We realized that most of the males actually went north for the winter. It's like, what? I thought something was wrong with the data. And so it's changing some of what we really understand, what we thought we knew about the owls themselves. They'll tough out the winter so they can be first back. If they're first back, they get dibs on the best burrow. If they have the best territory, they're gonna be able to have the most reproduction. The females, they come back from California or Nevada, they're looking for a good provider male with a good burrow. The males do most of the hunting, flying off to find small rodents like mice and kangaroo rats. The females stay close to the nest, but will pick off easy prey like grasshoppers to feed their young. The females spend more time inside the burrows with their babies, while the males spend more time outside, hunting or standing guard. Because of this, the male's feathers are usually more faded, bleached by the sun. Because the depot had been off limits for so long, it provided some undisturbed prairie for the burrowing owls. And now, the depot is an anchor point of a larger migration and regional population. Birds from here will go out to repopulate areas that were offline, if you will, that have habitats come back. Uh, owls from here will go there, or owls from like British Columbia come here. So there's a regional population, let's give them a chance. But they need someplace stable for a long term. Well, that's part of what the depot is. After nine years of working on the depot, David has brought the population of burrowing owls back from the brink. This year, he captured 96 adults, and he banded 172 babies of the next generation. We find that if we want to use artificial burrows, it works, okay? Do you want to run artificial burrows for 100 years? Probably not. It's a labor-intensive exercise. Um, is it a stopgap measure? Yes. They are declining uh, and their range is contracting, but there's a lot you can do. I'm an owl person, yeah? And so I'm going to do this until my last breath. That's easy.
I've always known. 